Hello. Hello, everyone. Please, panel, sit down. I thought you did, we didn't need an introduction to the introduction to the introduction, so uh, I thought we could all come out at once. Uh, welcome, Tech Chillers, to the first, the first event, the first panel of Tech Chill. If you think of Tech Chill as a festival, this is the bottom of the bill, the worst of the support acts. On the other hand, if you think of it as a conference, then this is the keynote, and it's the thing that you should really be here for. Uh, my name's Mike Collier. I'm not from Silicon Valley. I don't have $100,000 in my pocket, so you don't have to pretend you know who I am. Um, I work for Latvian Public Media, LSM, and I think they got me here because I was cheap. They did offer to supply water, drinks, but we decided to bring our own with us. Uh, <laughs> all my panelists are experts on startups and that kind of thing. Um, I need to give my own credentials at the start as well. I have founded one company. Uh, it still exists. It allows me to send invoices to people. Therefore, death is my exit strategy. <laughs> now, why am I here? As you've already probably realized, um, I, this is not my uh, natural habitat. I think I'm here as a sort of uh, lightning vein for all the negative vibes that might be in the room. So I want you to project all your frustrations, all your negative vibes towards me. I'll carry them out and then you can all, all have a lovely time uh, tech chilling together. Um, a couple of years ago, I came to Tech Chill, and I realized why I don't really fit in, because I went into one of the deal-making rooms, and everyone was in there being very enthusiastic, pitching to each other, lots of beautiful young people doing beautiful young things. And I felt like an atheist in church. You know, you can still go to a church to admire the architecture, you might like the hymns, you might like the idea that there's a God, but you don't actually believe very much. So I'm hoping that my panel here will be able to convert me to the true way of uh, thinking, a proper theology, because after all, we are here to pitch, and what is pitching if not praying? Because who do we pray to? The angels, the business angels, to grant us a miracle of funding. Right, so who do we have on the panel? First of all, we have from Estonia, Prit Saluma. He's Estonian, so he's been born with startups, basically. Uh, Preet is also the lead singer of Estonia's top goth band, Moon Cascade. Yeah! Moon Cascade is actually a business development and software company, I understand, and he's uh, a big cheese with uh, latitude, which is kind of like the Manchester United to the Manchester City of Tech Chill. We also have, I'm going to talk to you about uh, latitude later on. We also have Ernest Yenov uh, of Edurio, which sounds more like a sort of Spanish metal band, in my opinion. Edurio. It, it had a dot com available. <laughs> um, <laughs> Ernest and myself have been following each other on social media for quite a while now, but this is the first time we've met and we can finally work out who's stalking who. Finally, as this is the superhero stage, it's the superhero stage. Why the superhero stage? Either we're all superheroes or we have the mentality of eight-year-olds. But if you want to be a superhero, you have to have an alliterative name. There's Peter Parker, Clark Kent, <laughs> Brian Braddock. Does anyone remember who Brian Braddock was? Captain Britain, yeah. <laughs> now Captain Brexit. <laughs> But oh, that cunt. Yeah. <laughs> Monty Munford, uh, Forbes superhero, contributes to all, pretty much everything. I'm particularly pleased that Monty is here because I've heard him on the BBC World Service several times. As I drive out of Riga, the trouble is, when I get to Vangaji, which is about 25 kilometers out, the signal drops, and whatever Monty's saying drops with it. 
So after the panel, I'm going to kidnap Monty, drive him to Vangaji, and past it, just to prove that he can say things as far as Lee Gatnet. Right. I've managed to use up about five minutes of this 25-minute panel with my useless patter already. So I'm going to launch into the questions by sitting down to adopt a less confrontational attitude. There's something for you as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me get a, let no, me get a question come on. out first. <laughs> okay, get let me get a question out while I you're answering. I can pour it I can drink. Like, oh. Yes, come on. Typical Estonian. Cheers, everybody. It's morning. Yeah. <laughs> I come from Estonia. I really, I do understand. Good thinking, man. Right. I'm going to get some work out of you. Startups, what is so special about them, if anything? Now, I've been covering startups as part of my sort of general news remit, and I am still not sure what we mean by the word startup. So, what is a startup, and is it special? Preet. Uh, Thank you, Preet. Yes. Uh, I don't know really because Estonia is all startups. We have more startups per capita than than Latvia, most likely. And um, I think there's nothing in, else to in, do, in, is there? In Estonia, every company is a startup. So, yeah, nothing special really in Estonia, I mean. But I mean, if I if a classic company to set up would be like a pizza parlor or something, right? Pizza parlor sets up, they want to sell pizzas to the local community, they want to pay their bills, they want to be sustainable. They're not setting up a pizza parlor with the object of selling out to Domino's after six months. So what's the difference between the people setting up the pizza parlor and like a startup? So I think when you set up a company, you set it up with aim to make money. When you set up a startup, you set it up with aim to have hope of making money in the future. So it's sort of mainly the longer time horizon. A startup. A startup. A start I, right. I, th I think there might be something um, which is special about startups. Again, I come from Estonia, I like the country. Latvia, I love, of course. I like Estonia because there is never sun, you have like two more days of sun here, excellent place. <laughs> I usually shave my beard when the sun comes out or when I come to Techchil uh, because I haven't seen sun for maybe four months now. Um, depressing, but the good thing about startups is that uh, I think you should look at this kind of like a ambition maybe because if you think and take about Estonia then you have a market of uh, a suburb part of Berlin, like 1.3 million if you want to make money you either have to be like really dirty uh, politician, uh, you have to be in oil or food industry and all the companies are there already, so basically you have to start working outside of Estonia, like from day zero. Easy. And this means startup. Can global just, can global just, company. Who's, yes? Who is in a startup in the audience? Hands up, please. So quite a like few. Three people. No, there's a few. I think the word startup is overused, right? It's, uh, uh, to me, a startup is something that's unprofitable and needs <laughs> help all the time. <laughs> It needs help from seed or accelerator or anything. I have a consultancy, and my consultancy was fucking profitable on the first day, right? Because I had to pay the bills, profit and loss. But startup, it's like a, I don't know if you, in English, a multitude of sins. It covers up a lot of shit. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And then. I mean. You know what I mean? And then the whole point of a startup is to is to raise money and flip it and, and the whole thing seems to be a bit old fashioned to me and I think there should be something else start up, middle up, end up fuck up, I don't know, <laughs> you know what I mean I think fuck up is actually a quite good word there because they very often do fuck up, do they, don't they most of them do so from, from thousand ideas maybe hundred get to a, some kind of execution, from hundred to a company there is like ten and then out of these ten one makes a big exit the meaning that 999 others are fuck ups, and the, the, the one is startup. Fuck ups. Fuck ups, yeah. So it would be quite good maybe if we, the policy makers and so on, and the people who are handing out funds for startups, if we got them to rebrand it as fuck ups, and then they could get the kind of positive vibe of the one that does make it through. Exactly. The kind of like a, a really fish wriggling contrast. through the net. And if they make it, we can call them upfucks. <laughs> yes. 
Well, yes. I mean, Latvia just uh, put the startup definition in, in law, in legislation, so I, I'm not sure how they would go with fuck-ups uh, <laughs> legislating. I, I this, heard that the language commission was quite, this is, quite strong. I think this is just a question of syntax, or, or like Set. semantics. Yeah, in a, it's syn so the, syntax question, I would that's say. That's really difficult in legislative context, because, I mean, there was a big debate in Parliament. How are we going to find business angels? Do we, do we now need to define what an angel is? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. But also a serious question, like the term startup. I mean, I, I'm, there are some amazing startups out there, I'm sure. But it seems to me that the mission of a startup is always to be like Silicon Valley zero sum game, right? You're a startup and you're going to become Facebook or SpaceX or whatever. I don't see the point of that. It's like you're a young company and you're going to stay in business for 10 years. You're going to employ people, you're going to have stability. Uh, and you're going to grow a business over that amount of time. And that type of life, or that type of career, or that type of company's lifespan seems to be forgotten. Because there are loads of companies out there that are young, middle, old companies that have been in existence for years. And we love legacy, and we love old companies. The thing with startups, I just think that maybe they're not in it for, they're in it for the short term. Can I, I mean, uh, let me just give a practical example. My first startup was actually in agriculture. Um, when, I, when I was in uni, uh, sort of, I, I, there was an opportunity to buy a piece of land during the, the recession, and, uh, and we did the maths, and uh, with the subsidies, it made a lot of sense to do that. So um, actually, that was a business that with a, had a very clear business plan. You didn't need to convince anyone. You just sort of grew stuff, and then, it, uh, and then you sold stuff. Um, the biggest challenge that I had, there was one existential problem uh, moment for, for uh, that uh, startup, uh, is when I, when I walked around my fresh sown field of grass and, uh, and lost my car keys. Uh, and it took about uh, three hours with metal detectors uh, for, the, for the local team on the ground to find them. I so think there there's an app for that. <laughs> sure. No, but this does, this does raise a, a valid point, I think, which is... Startups, we tend to associate them with like IT, with apps, things like that. I mean, they can all be unplugged. We're still going to need farmers to give us food. I mean, there is, it sometimes seems that the sort of startup community is just very, very good at self publicity and maybe sometimes drifts away from reality. But I wanted to pick up a point of what uh, Monty was saying actually about failure. It seems to me that in the last couple of years, there's been this sort of uh, cult of failure, this like failure is fun, that you're not really a success unless you've failed multiple times and oh didn't we learn lots of great lessons along the way. But it always seems to me that this is a, a bit disingenuous in that I associate failure with misery, stress, worrying about you know how you're going to feed the, how you're going to feed your family embarrassment all these sorts of things potato and, jokes hmm? potato jokes potato jokes uh, latvians know what i'm talking about <laughs> uh, well you know i guess you know if you, if if you can't afford to a tv then you could make some jokes about potatoes but i mean well, my well, my well, real well, point is is that uh, i think if you are playing with this cult of failure, it's not really failure. You can afford to fail. And when a business fails, it usually leaves unpaid bills. It leaves uh, contractors who are out of pocket. And this never really seems to get covered. So, I mean, do we have any reflections on failure? Because if failure can be a, a positive, then surely success can be a negative as well. It's overused, right, as a thing, that if you fail, then you're going to be more successful. But if I wake up in the morning and I have a boner, that's successful. If I wake up in the morning and it's like that, then I'm a failure. And I don't like that feeling, I like that. <laughs> so well, I mean, not, it depends so who you're sharing a bed with, Monty, really. <laughs> he was alone, Sorry most likely. <laughs> but but, 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 but I, I agree with this myth of failure. It's, it's quite nice. It's nice that you fail and you do it again, and, and the bank managers will lend you more money because you failed the first time, all of this bollocks. Do you know what I mean? But it's, why, not, why not just win all the time? Isn't that much a better You want to life? win all the fucking time. Every Everybody day. wants to win all the fucking time. Me too. But I think, guys... No, because if failure has a moral benefit, then even if you are winning all the time, every now and again, you should make yourself fail just so that you appreciate I, I th it. I think, I mean, I think startups genuinely need to believe in positive failure. And, and I think that's... 
sort of their response to the afterlife in religion? I mean, you believe that there if you go through there. the motions, you do the growth, you get the angels, there will be a happier future even when the thing finishes. So, even so I think if the angels needs... are fucking mad and very angry at you <laughs> because you've burned all their money. But, but do you think that VCs like failure? Now, but the thing is that just, I think both the life cycle and everything, maybe it has something to do with millennials. Because look at the attention span of today. Who reads like a full news article or like seven pages of somebody thinking on the, on the paper? They want to have it like 80 second, 60 second bit on YouTube. Same is with companies. I get bored after five years of working on one shit all the time. I don't want to build a hundred year company. Although I have friends who want to, but I too want to. But, <laughs> but, but still, general emphasis on this. And then, then the same thing is with failure. I think they just rebranded a painful lesson with the word failure. That's it. It's a painful lesson, nothing more. And nobody should take it like that serious as failure. Come on. Losing some money, everybody does it like all the time. Look at the people going into casinos. I think... I think uh, They're not failures, <laughs> mostly. <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody likes failing, everybody likes having failed. And when, when you come to these uh, conferences and, and there's somebody on stage, they will talk a lot about their past failures. Very few people, if you look carefully, will talk about, well, I think I'm kind of failing at the moment, I'm not sure how this is going to go. And, uh, and, and most people sort of say, all my past lessons uh, were, were sort of failures, but now I hold the truth to how to do things. I've learned all these things. Three years from then, they'll probably use the same story as, a, as, a, as the, the, the biggest failure. So, so just be cautious of when people talk about their past failures and current successes. Well, this, this brings me to another thing. I thought if we can get one thing out of this discussion, it may be some tips about how to identify what I call project people. So these are the people who are constantly doing some sort of business venture, but it always seems to be funded from some sort of government handout or it's uh, some kind of assisted thing. And, I mean, we've all encountered these people, I'm sure. They come to things like this. There must be a few in the audience. And they're in love with startup culture. I don't think they're really very interested in running a business. It's, it's the fact that this can be an ongoing kind of... I mean, all industries have this, I should, I should admit. I mean, most of us journalists who are here, we're here for the sandwiches and for the coffee, to be perfectly honest. But, but how do we recognize project people as opposed to people who are really want to be in business? This is a tough question, actually. It's, a, it's an intelligent question. <laughs> exactly. That's why we're struggling. <laughs> the rest of I thought we fun. should be taking piss on the stage here and the startups and making fun. You're coming up with a serious question. Come on. Jesus, we open man. the wine, man. What are you doing? Hey, well, look, Pete, if you don't like it, you can leave. I will leave, actually. I will leave in four minutes. Okay, okay? fair enough. <laughs> I will leave in four minutes. Other, other industries, I mean, other types of organization don't have as many people who claim to be just, I'm an expert in corporate. I mean, you'd, you'd be an expert in something like oil and gas or retail, etc. In startups, there are people who go by being experts in startup, and, and, and that's kind of a bit scary, because uh, it's, just, it's just a way of doing things. It's not actually any domain knowledge. I, I, I think when, when I worked for a startup, I was thinking about this in London the other day, as I was getting off the tube, and I thought, when I worked for a startup, I never got the tube. I always got a taxi. Always because I thought I had the money to do what the fuck I wanted to do. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so if you're a start, there's th I think there's two things, right? If you're in a startup and you've raised some money, right? The first thing you do when you raise money is think, great, now how can we cut back on our spending? That's the first thing that's quite good. The second thing is, is as I'm talking about this, I've forgotten what I was going to say. <laughs> it was really important. Oh yeah, it was, don't be too lush with your money. But at the same time, don't be too mean. And you hear a lot of stories about lean startups. Oh, you know, we got this developer for two pounds, and we got this guy in India for three pounds, or this geezer in Estonia for 50 cents. Do you know what I mean? Um, as if this is a badge of honor. You know, you've got to pay your way. And if, if, when you're a lean startup, which is another myth, like failure, do you know what I mean? It's, you know, just pay your bills, and when you raise money, you'll be able to, you'll know what to do with it. 
Yeah, I mean, I must admit, when you go into some of these uh, corporate kind of campuses, which everyone seems uh, uh, compulsory to set up, I mean, a lean startup, I would go in there and I would take out the ping pong tables and the bean bags to begin with. I mean, what? I mean, these seem to be in lieu of working rights. Right. You you, look, you, you've it, got no, con you, no long-term contract, but you can have a beanbag and a fucking ping-pong table. I think the beanbag and ping-pong table, there must be. Wouldn't you like to, like, program while having constant bap 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 going in background? It so much gets you into the flow. It's like such a great, like, like background music. Anyway, but uh, you asked a serious question, so I will... Somebody's calling me twice, like my co-founder, fuck off. Oh, yeah. sh yes, you've got a phone on your watch. Yes, I have a phone on my watch. <laughs> yes. Um, and it also knows how, what's my heart rate, and it says nothing. Um, <laughs> He's Estonian. But, but I, 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 I'm Estonian. If I would be Finn, I had like a minus heart rate. The, but I think when answering a serious question, then I have seen these project people, and they're scary because they have this like mad sparkle in their eyes. Uh, and, and how to differentiate between the, like this project person and the serious startup entrepreneur is that you have somebody who l enjoys the culture and the other guy just wants to get shit done. That's it. He wants to get shit done. He wants to get something out there which is real and can be used by somebody. And I think this is the differentiator. That's it. While I've still got you here, yeah. I want to uh, criticize you. One minute. Uh, all right, Latitude, a couple of years ago. Yeah. We were being lectured on startups and entrepreneurism and you know, the importance of doing business was by I there? Prince fucking Andrew. Oh, yes, yes, Andrew. He I was mean, amazing. A guy who still gets money from his mother. <laughs> yeah, but he sponsored the fucking event. What can you say? <laughs> I, met, I met him. The, <laughs> <laughs> I met him at the palace. At the yeah, palace. Right, uh, in November. And they invited someone like me <laughs> to the palace, right? And I've got a great story about what I did to Prince Andrew at the palace, but I can't tell you. Oh, this is a good thing. Otherwise, it, it would, be, would, it, would it be embarrassing for us or for you? I think it would be the end of my marriage. Then the monarchy? No, don't mean it in that much. The end of my marriage, the end of trust, the end of my kids' respect, the end of my career. I'd probably be, be beheaded. But, but it's a good story. But I think it does at least, the fact that a guy like that can speak at a, a big conference like this because, it, because he's paying or because, you know, they want to get their headlines shows that there is a certain amount of bullshit involved, right? Now listen, I spoke to him for 10 minutes, right? And as I said to my family, as I was saying to the Duke of York at the palace last month, ha, 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 <laughs> so they got bored of him, I thought he probably wouldn't be that smart, but he was all right. He's, he's, a, he's a decent person. I thought he was all right. I, I think you have different royalties who haven't been that decent in the past. Maybe they're different every time they come out. <laughs> it could be. Anyway, guys, um, I just realized I don't have time for this shit, so okay, I'm just leaving. just fuck off. We need to continue I'm, I'm, I'm leaving, yes, anyway. Bye. Thanks for the wine. Thanks yeah. for um, the thing. And um, I'm actually leaving to host another stage there, which will be much more interesting than this shitty <laughs> panel. Bye bye, Preet. I, I think that, that I mean, good luck recruiting more e residents. Uh, I, I think what you what you sort of raised. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, Prince Andrew is a startup country. It doesn't really matter what they talk about at the, the events, right? I mean, there there are people like like Monty who just get funded by startup conferences, whizzes in between one to the other, uh, goes to parties, and uh, and everybody loves listening to whatever he has to say. Um, and uh, and so, so I think, I mean, Particularly when he talks about his erections. <laughs> but then, all right, we'll, we'll, we'll round things up, but I'd like to, maybe you could give me a couple of tips on what can you get from things like this. You know, how do you sort the wheat from the chaff? How do you tell when you look at the itinerary and it says X is the new Y or 10 things you need to know about Z? Is that, does that ring a, an alarm bell that this is just going to be... I, I, this is the third year I've been to Tech Chill, right? And I've, it's cold and I come here in February and it's my first conference. This conference is amazing, right? And I have to choose. I think, some, it's, I think in June there's something like 15 conferences and all that. Pick your conference. 
pick your networking, um, and unlike me in the past, actually listen to people on stage, because I used to go and just get drunk, and just go to the hotel. And well, you are a journalist. Me. Well, I'm getting drunk now, actually. Um, but, but yeah, but go and see things. Don't just look at the show outside or, you know, do the networking, which is very important. But find someone that you really want to listen to and sit down and listen. Turn your fucking phone off and listen to someone talk about their business or failure or whatever and, and do that. Because I, I, I didn't do enough of it and I regret it. I'd, I'd say, I mean, startups can be a lonely thing. You sort of sit in your bubble with your team and you sort of solving the world to get problems together, but, uh, um, but there's sort of no real reasons to meet people uh, who are facing the same issues. And I mean, frankly, if I care about education, I'll go to an education conference and meet the, my potential customers, none of whom I believe are sitting in this room. Uh, if you are, we'll talk later. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, it's mainly about uh, getting to know people who are going through similar things. So you feel a bit less lonely, you uphold your myth in fun failure, and uh, and it and it keeps you going. It's essentially like a self-help event uh, uh, that that you, you get most out of by by getting into experiences that you didn't think you you would. Okay, well I'll wrap things up. Hang on, hang on. What's your, what do you think? Well, this is what I'm going to say now. Okay, in the I would suggest maybe be friendly. Uh, be thoughtful, as you say, listen, and be sceptical, because we're all taught that we need to be more sceptical, and if, if nothing else, hopefully this panel has shown that sceptical is healthy, because sceptical, after all, is the new trust. Or is it? <laughs> anyway, with that, thank you to the panel, and I hope you all have a really good tech chill. Thank you. Thank you.